Thank you. Um, so we're at Alley Gasket. We're the sponsor of uh, this event, and it's been a real pleasure kind of uh, taking that around for the last day and eating dinner with them last night. And I had uh, all these nice things to uh, prepare and say about Ed um, before I ever met him, but now that I've met him, I'm not going to say any of them. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, so... You know, it's really good to have a chance to have, like, really a, a nationally recognized speaker here uh, for us to listen to. And especially the fact that, like, he comes from Birmingham and went to UAB and he knows about our specific uh, challenges and opportunities. And um, I guess from, you know, I work for Allegasco. I've worked there for four years. And I'm young, or at least I'm, you know, pretty young. But, uh, you know, I've, I've, ha I've had a passion for this stuff, this like, green building stuff. And when I signed on with Allegasco, I let them know that I was real passionate about it. And, uh, and they fit me into a role where I could kind of help our organization. But uh, I believe it's sort of like representative of our generation that like we're, we want to step up and take responsibility for uh, sustainability and bringing things uh, back to an equilibrium. And uh, I was listening to uh, Warren Buffett recently, who we all know is the world's uh, largest investor, has the most wealth. And uh, a woman asked him if he had 50 more years to live, what he would invest his time into knowing backwards and forwards. And the two things that he answered were uh, technology and energy. And it's just to say that that's like, those are huge fields and they're huge problems and they need huge solutions. And, uh, and we're, it's people like us and our generation, the, the younger of us, who are really going to be the ones who take on that challenge. And I think that's really important. And Allegasco recognizes that. We've got uh, one lead building right now, and we've got another one uh, under the works that we've sort of helped with. And uh, we see uh, energy as like a really crucial part of this whole discussion. And, uh, you know, I just want to say that like we're really, really happy to be part of this discussion. And uh, it's really an opportunity to sponsor uh, Ed and be able to take him around the town because he really, really has some great things to say that I know we're all going to appreciate. So, with that, I think we've got one more question to come up here. I think it's long time with the Institute of Sustainability, and if you've not had the privilege to hear Ed McMahon, you're in for a real treat tonight, I can tell you that. And uh, at the Institute of Sustainability, we work with businesses, colleges, universities, and helping them to operate in a more environmentally friendly manner. And so we hope that uh, you enjoy this speech. And with further ado, I think now. crowd here tonight. You know, I know Rosario Dawson is on the other side of campus uh, tonight, and, uh, and uh, believe me, she's a little better looking than I am, so if you, uh, you may be in the wrong room, uh, for some of you. Uh, I'd like to just say, uh, to start off, tell you a few stories and then get started with what I'm going to talk about. Sustainable development. You know, some people call that green development. Some people call it environmentally sensitive development. We're going to talk about all of those things. I want to start off and tell you a little story how I got interested in all this. Uh, 1969, and I apologize to people who've heard this story already today. I was a young second lieutenant in the United States Army, and I had just finished jungle warfare training, and I was getting ready to go to Vietnam with many of my contemporaries. And literally about a week before I was supposed to fly off to Thompson Newt Air Force Base, where I was going to be sent up to a small fire base in the Central Highlands of Vietnam, I got a call from the Pentagon, and I had this colonel on the other end of the line. He's from the personnel division. He says to me, Lieutenant McMahon, do you have any interest at all in being reassigned to Germany? Okay. <laughs> Germany or Vietnam? I said, yeah, Germany. That sounds very good. Germany. And I got very, very lucky. I was sent to Heidelberg, West Germany. Heidelberg is the headquarters of the U.S. military in Europe. It's the site of the oldest university in Germany and one of the most beautiful cities on the planet Earth. I was assigned as an aide to an American general, and I spent two and a half years of my life flying all over Europe in a helicopter. And that experience completely and totally changed my life. I didn't realize quite how much it would change my life until I flew home here to Birmingham, Alabama. And I got out of the plane and I drove home. And for, for the first time in my life, I saw the American landscape with a completely different set of eyes. Because to travel is to learn. 
And I hope that's what we'll do tonight, is we'll learn a little bit about how the world is changing, and the world is changing. I believe we're at the beginning of a new era in America and the world that will change the way we live, the way we work, the way we move around, in ways no less fundamental than the Industrial Revolution. And this, of course, is the Sustainability Revolution. And it's about finding better, smarter, greener, more energy efficient ways to do all the things we've just talked about. So I want to get started uh, with that and talk a little bit about what I do first for a living. I work for the Urban Land Institute in Washington, D.C. We are an international nonprofit organization. We work to foster best practices in land use and development, both in this country and around the world. We have about 30,000 members. They are made up of everybody who's involved in the real estate development industry or land use, and that includes developers and architects and landscape architects and planners and lawyers and financiers and elected officials. About 20% of our members are mayors and other elected officials. And, you know, we don't have, we're not an advocacy group. We don't lobby. What we do is research and education, trying to try figure out what works best in real estate and development. And I can tell you that the shift of development, the paradigm of development is changing in America, shifting from what you've seen for the most of your lifetimes, and shifting in a better direction. We'll talk about that. Now, tonight, sustainability. You know, there's some people who are very upset about the United Nations. They don't like the United Nations, and, but, you know, this is their definition. But nobody really remembers that, even though it's all about intergenerational responsibility. It means about thinking about your children your grandchildren, the future, and planning for the future. By the way, that's my son, Sean McMahon. He's actually 31 now. But this is what this is about. It's about those guys. It's about our kids. And it's about what kind of future they're going to have. And it's also about this. It's about balance. It's about harmony. It's about the relationship between conservation and economic development, between jobs and the environment between man and nature. You know, we can talk about how those things can work together. It's also about finding win-win solutions to the problems that face us in America today. I think we spend way too much time in this country fighting about what we disagree about. And not nearly enough time sitting down together, community by community, to talk about what we do agree about. And when we do that, what we find is there's a lot of agreement about particularly our communities. And so what I'm going to try to talk about tonight is some of the win-win-win solutions, things that are good for business, good for the environment, good for the community all at the same time. We hope to give you a couple of examples of that. Now, why has this topic become so important in recent years? Why is this something that, you know, some people are really excited about, other people are worried about, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Let's just talk about how the world is changing. Let's talk about this issue. Something in some states you're forbidden to use this term. You know, climate change. You know, I don't care what you, whether you believe that man is causing the climate to change, but the climate is changing. It is very hard to deny that it is getting hotter. That we're having more droughts. We're having more flight, floods. We're having heat waves. The last eight months of this year are the hottest eight months ever recorded since the U.S. Weather Service started peaking the temperature. And guess what? Right now, Arctic ice in the Arctic is the lowest it has ever been. And the summer's not over yet. It's going to keep melting for a while. So, okay, so weather's changing, extreme weather. Who's causing that? Well, we don't know. Some people say, here's, who, here's some of the people who will tell you that climate change is real. How about the insurance industry? How about the CIA? How about the U.S. military? How about virtually all of our Nobel laureates? How about every National Academy of Science in the world? If this is a hoax, this is the biggest hoax in the history of the world. But I'm going to give you a definitive proof tonight to try to change this. So, all right, you don't have to believe this, but let's move on. Let's talk about energy. Let's talk about energy. For about the last 50 years, the United States has had an energy policy that I could sum up this way. It's been to maximize demand, to minimize supply, and to send billions of dollars to the people who hate us. Now that is not a very sensible energy policy. You know, 2008, we're actually doing better right now. We've actually cut our imported oil the last two years because of 
finding oil in North Dakota, for example, or getting some more oil from Canada. We're actually, you know, right now we're doing better than we have done for a long time. But, you know, T. Boone's Pickens, and, you know, I love to hear T. Boone's Pickens talk. He used to say, like, $600 billion. That's what we're sending over to $600 billion. I think what we could do is $600 billion here at home, particularly given the financial problems that we're facing today. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. You know, do you think that the long-term trend for energy prices in America is to, you know, go down or to go up? You know, who thinks that we're going to have cheaper gas in the future? Anybody, you think, I mean, if you think we're going to have cheaper gas 10 years from now, let me say one word to you. China. How about India? How about Indonesia? How about Brazil? It's all about rising worldwide demand for energy. Right now, we pump about 86 million barrels of oil a day. The United States uses about 21 million of those barrels a day. We have 5% of the world's population. We use 25% of the world's energy. So what happens to oil... When everyone in China, one billion people there, one billion people in India, when they all have cars, say what we do. You know, what happens to America when gas reaches $5 a gallon, $6 a gallon, $8 a gallon, or $10 a gallon, the way it already is in Europe and has been for quite a long time? Are we ready for that kind of future? You know, we scream if gas goes up 10 cents a gallon. 20 cents a gallon. All right, let's talk about, uh-oh, uh -oh, that's not good, okay, here we go. You know, so we need to start thinking about all the different ways, you know, we hear, you know, one side says we need to conserve, the other side we says we need to produce more, well, we probably need to do a little of both, produce more, conserve more, but here's what you need to think about, the cheapest, least expensive, easiest way to reduce energy use is to save it, is to conservation. And I want to just tell you what I mean by that, you know, Saving energy costs less than building power plants. All right, so let me give you an example of that. 1973, Jerry Brown, he was the governor of California then, uh, too. Second go around. Now. He was running for governor in 1972, and he needed to get some votes out of Orange County. Orange County, as most of you know, is the most Republican part of California. And a proposed nuclear power plant was going to be sited in Orange County. And all the people in Orange County did not want a nuclear power plant in their backyard. And so Jerry Brown decided to campaign against it. But he had no idea how to meet the power needs of the fastest growing state in the United States, California, at that time. So he, gets, he comes out against that nuclear power plant. He gets elected governor of California. And then he's sitting around a couple weeks after he gets elected, and this guy from Caltech comes in to see him and says, Governor, I'd like to talk to you about that nuclear power plant. He goes, okay. He said, I have one word to say to you. He says, what's that? He says, refrigerator. He said, refrigerator? What are you talking about? He said, you know, if we had energy efficient refrigerators in California, you wouldn't have to build that power plant. And so, all the way back in 1973, California became the first American state to set energy efficiency goals for appliances. And they started thinking about energy speed long before anybody else did. And as a result, for the last 35 years, per capita electricity consumption in California has stayed flat, while it has gone up by 50% in the rest of the United States. Now, what does that mean in real terms? It means that they didn't have to build 50 power plants. You know, the least expensive power plant is the one you don't have to build. <laughs> which is why energy conservation and efficiency is so important. And this is something that's catching on, you know, talk about, you know, think, think about renewable energy. This is the new solar array, one of three at the Denver airport. Now supplying 7,000 megawatts of power. You know, how about Walmart stores with solar panels all over their roofs? This is going to be all Walmart stores going to be this pretty soon. You know, getting Walmart is like a tree hugger. <laughs> you know, you know, you know who has the biggest solar array in the state of Alabama? Anybody know? The National Guard headquarters in Montgomery has the largest solar array in this state. The U.S. military understands the need to rely on something other than foreign oil. 
Okay? You know, I just, uh, just this week, on Monday, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, I don't know if people saw it, about parking lots being covered with solar panels. Washington Redskins football stadium is now getting 20% of their power on game day from solar panels in their parking lot. And it, it provides all the power for the stadium the rest of the time. Okay, well, you know, that might make some sense to think about that. Now here's another issue we need to think about, how we've been developing for the last 50 years, you know? <coughs> Large lot subdivisions and strip commercial development, which of course, when we did that, that meant we had to drive everywhere for everything. And it's, you know, it's interesting, ironically, in America for 50 years, our families kept getting smaller and smaller, but each on average person kept using more and more land. And that, of course, meant this. This is I-95. Outside of Washington, I can tell you that in the 40 years I've lived up there now, we've never not been widening Interstate 95. Never. And you know why? Because we used to think that if you all you did was like widen the road, you could beat congestion. Well, we've learned that if that's your only solution to traffic congestion, that's like letting out your belt to fight obesity. <laughs> well, hey, you need to think about the relationship between land use and transportation. That just makes some sense. Okay, so then here's our other problem now. Nobody wants to pay for anything anymore. We haven't raised the federal gas tax since 1993. The American Society of Civil Engineers says we have a two trillion dollar backlog in infrastructure in the United States. You know, we don't want to raise the gas tax. We don't want to pay tolls. We don't want to pay user fees. But we want the best of everything in America. We just don't want to pay for it. So, you know, think about international competition. You know, sustainability is about making us more competitive, more resilient. It's about reducing costs. But, you know, we ought to be the world's leader in this. But, you know, Germany's the world leader in solar power. Denmark's the leading manufacturer of wind turbines. And who's using more wind power than anybody in the world? China. Who would think of that? And let's talk about passenger rail in America. Well, you go to Europe or Asia, and passenger rail is fast, frequent, and it goes everywhere. How about in the United States? Well, it's slow, infrequent, or non-existent. You want to take Amtrak today from Chicago to New York? You can do that. It takes five and a half hours longer than it did in the 1930s. You want to go from Houston to Dallas? You can do that, too. There's one train a day. It takes 17 hours. Want to go from Memphis to Birmingham? Forget about it. Want to go from Memphis to Nashville? Can't do it. You want to go from Berlin to Hamburg? It's 20 trains a day. They go 200 miles an hour. You don't even have to think about it. We have one, we have decent train service one place in America. It's called from Washington, D.C. to New York. Guess what? There's a train every half hour, all day long, every day. Does anybody take the train? Well, yeah. More people take the train from Washington, New York than all the airlines combined. Because it's fast, frequent. You don't have to think about it. You know, we're not really serious about energy consumption until we start giving us alternatives to getting around the car. One of the things I learned living in Europe is Europeans don't hate cars. They love cars just like we do. The big difference is they don't have to use them all the time. They have way more transportation choice than we do. They have the S-Bahn and the U-Bahn and the streetcars and the trolleys and the high-speed trains. And oh, and you can walk. <laughs> well, there's a concept. My wife and I walked across Tuscany when I turned 50. And it was in September, and we would sit down in some little square, what they call it, piazza in Italy. We'd be having our little cappuccino in the morning, and then the school bells would ring. And all of a sudden, the piazza would fill up with all the mothers walking to school holding their children's hand. That's convenience, ladies and gentlemen. We think we value convenience. We think we understand convenience. Here's another thing. Growing population. We are the fastest growing industrialized nation. None of the nations in Europe are adding population. We are 100 million people by 2050. You know, that's 3 million people a year. It's about a million housing units a year. We're going to grow. So where are we going to put all these people? How are we going to arrange all this new development? Where are the jobs going to be? Are we ready for that? What about demography? Yes, the demographics of America are changing. We're getting older, we're getting younger, we're getting more diverse, we're having more single people. People are getting married less. 
Guess what? We have 27 million women living alone in America today. Do you think all those single women want a five-acre lot out in the suburbs with a lot that's, you know, too big to mow but too small to farm? Or would they like an alternative to large lot housing? We'll talk about that. So this is what a lot of people think, you know, used to be, you know, people say, oh, that's about tree hugging, that's no growth. Compromised lifestyles. High cost. That's the, here's the reality. It's improved comfort and durability, increased product differentiation, current and future procurement, lower operating costs. Green can be good for you and your pocketbook too. Now, a lot of different things. Sustainability, though, is a lot, lot, lot more than this. It's about you know, if you look up the definition of sustainable, I mean, we think this technology is part of it. I'll talk, I'm going to talk a lot about technology tonight, but sustainable, if you look up the definition of the dictionary, it means enduring. A sustainable community is a place of enduring value. So, you know, we need to think about how do we create places that people love and that they want to take care of. Now, there are many shades of green. We'll talk about a couple of them. Parsley green, grass green, tree green, full spectrum green. Let's talk about each of these. Parsley green. You know, we've always had this kind of thing in America, you know, green PR, green marketing, green washing. It's the same old thing, but you just talk about it differently. Remember when the new urbanism started, we had some home builders who would just take a subdivision and say, well, let's just call it a town. Nothing's different, we'll just call it a neighborhood. You know, that's like just changing the terminology, but keep doing the same thing. Now, there's another form of green, tree green. That's the vertical dimension of sustainability. That's about what's going on inside of our buildings. Indoor air quality, energy efficiency, water use, the toxicity of materials, et cetera, et cetera. So what about green building? Well, green building is not a fad, ladies and gentlemen. It is here to stay. You know, right now, and I know these statistics are pretty accurate because my son is the Assistant Director of Research at the U.S. Green Building Council in Washington. You know, we now have 34,243-plus green certified buildings in the United States, almost all built within the last 10 years. Now, I know Alabama's a little behind on this. We have about 65 green certified buildings in Alabama. Ruffner Mountain Nature Center, a couple of new dormitories over at Birmingham Southern, the new airport expansion, that will be lead sort of uh, But, you know, once again, it's catching on here just like everywhere else. And, you know, this is a, a market that is growing at, by leaps and bounds. Twelve billion in 2008, expected to grow by 60 billion by next year. You know, we're going to talk about this market, too. And this is just the cities that require green building. <coughs> You know, Birmingham doesn't require this. When you go to Washington, all major buildings must be green buildings. Uh, you know, and you know that's you know other cities are providing you know incentives and incentives, encouraging that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let me show you what green buildings look like. They're a lot of different. They look lots of different things. This is the first lead platinum building in America. It's the headquarters of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation in Annapolis. Okay, <coughs> the very first one, the year 2000. How about you know skyscrapers? Every new high-rise building built in New York City in the last five years has been a lead certified building. Every one. How'd you like to build the last non-green office building in America? Do <laughs> you think that'd be a good investment? How about green schools? You know, everywhere you look, we're building green, lead certified, energy efficient, high performance schools, like the Homewood Middle School, for example, close by. How about courthouses? Like how about Cobb County? You know, how about corporate headquarters? And then I could probably, I could give you a list of 50 corporate headquarters. Here's a few. U.S. Airways, Bacardi Runs, Steer One, Puzzle Lightning. You go on and on. How about the biggest hotel in the world at the Palazzo Casino? Lead Silver. It's the largest green certified building in the world. But the largest green roof in the world. Ford, 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 Ford Motor Company in Detroit. How about the Washington Nation Nationals Baseball Stadium, lead certified baseball stadium? How about the first lead certified McDonald's in America? It's in Savannah, Georgia. And now there's lots of them. You know, how about here in the state of Alabama? You know, the Miller Gorey Center at Auburn, you know? Auburn, 
along with almost 700 other universities, has signed an agreement called the President's College, University College President's Climate and Energy Agreement. They have agreed that all new campus buildings will be green buildings in the future. All new college buildings. That's what 700 universities have agreed to. So, you don't think this is, you think this is a fad? You know, and this is a Wall Street Journal article about, you know, once skeptics build a receipt green and green, they know they can make money. And what I do is I work with builders and developers who are in this not because they're environmentalists, not because they're greenies, but because they see this as putting money in their pockets. You know, this is a quote from Ernst and Young, which has a business risk report. They say, in the future, virtually all new buildings will be green, high performance buildings. People say, well, what does it cost to build a green building? Well, it costs just a little bit more, a tiny bit more. And in fact, the costs keep coming down. They keep going down, down, down as experience <laughs> keeps going up. And products get better and materials get better. It used to be people would design a regular building, a conventional building, then they come in at the end and say, let's make it green. It was like an add-on. Now they start at the beginning. All the different ways that they can green a building from the beginning, the holistic approach. And think about, you know, experience. In the year 2000, we only had 543 league certified professionals. Those are green professionals. 543. Last year we had 143,000 league certified professionals. So we have lots more experience. People know what they're doing. They've got lessons learned, et cetera, et cetera. And what about value? People I work with are concerned about things like return on investment, higher rents, higher asking prices. You know, they're concerned about indoor <coughs> the health of their employees. They're concerned about the reputation, the branding, the stature of, uh, stature of their company. Particularly young people want to work in green buildings and for green companies. And so, yes, we're finding there is a green premium. You know, and this is, I love this quote from the Harvard Business Journal says, as green buildings become more common, conventional buildings will rapidly lose value and become obsolete. You know, in our business, you know, we talk about Class A office buildings. Well, Class A is becoming synonymous with green. If you're not building green, you're not building Class A. So, then the other question people say, what about the recession? How's that affecting green buildings? Well, slowed it down. We're not building as many things like we were before the recession, but it's not fundamentally shifting the market sh change. Slowed it down, but you know, we're, we're shifting to green real estate in America. I'm going to talk about, you know, another aspect of this, recycling, reuse, redevelopment. You know, we recycle cans and bottles, but we keep doing this in America, tearing down our older buildings. And I want to tell you that the uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation just came out with a fantastic study on the environmental value of the reuse of existing buildings. It turns out that the greenest building is often an existing building. And it turns out there's great energy savings in actually just keeping the existing building and retrofitting as opposed to tearing it down and putting up a new high efficiency building. And in fact, it takes almost, in some cases, up to 80 years to get back to even by the efficient operation of the new building to replace all the energy you use in demolishing the old building and then building the new one. So think about that. And you know, uh, think about this in terms of like our waste management stream. Most of the largest percentage of our waste, uh, things in our waste dumps in the country is construction debris. Most of that comes from tearing down old buildings. You know, you just save one little small building, like you know, you might see in downtown Birmingham somewhere, it's like equivalent to saving. 130, 1.34 million cans. That's a pretty good recycling bang for your buck. So most buildings are existing buildings, about 98% of them. You know, even at the height of the, of the boom building boom, we were only replacing about 2% of our building stock a year. Now we're replacing it like a half a percent a year. And most of those buildings are, you know, 20, 20 years old or older. So the biggest market is not in new green buildings. The biggest market is in the retrofitting of existing buildings. Here's an example, the Empire State Building, one of the most iconic buildings in America. Just gone through a three-year, uh, it's gone through a retrofit. And they're going to get, you know, they're reduced, they've reduced the energy use that building by 40% and they have a three-year payback. You know, doesn't that make some economic sense to do stuff like that? Here's another example. This is the uh, former Stewart's Department Store in Baltimore. It's abandoned. 
Now it's the World Headquarters of the Catholic Relief Services. It's a LEED certified historic building. But you know, LEED has its limitations. This is a LEED certified Taco Bell. You know, what are its limitations? Well, it's just like every other Taco Bell. Surrounded by asphalt, lots of plastic plates and forks and knives. It's just, you know, it says anywhere USA. So LEED doesn't do everything. It only does some things. I talked about the vertical dimension of green, what's going on inside the building. We need to think about the horizontal dimension of green as well, what I call grass green. This relates to things like where we put our buildings, how they relate to each other, how we arrange them, master planning, designing in harmony with nature. You know, here's two great quotes. Green buildings in wrong locations are not truly green. And where we build is just as important as what you build. And that's because, you know, you could build a green building out here, but if everybody has to drive to it, then we're going to, you know, use all our energy in the cars getting there back and forth. So we need to start thinking about where we're putting these buildings, not just what's in them. And that paradigm is changing. You know, for years, Birmingham's a great example of this, we were moving everything out of the city. You know, that was the world headquarters for Sears for many years, and the Sears Tower in downtown Chicago. And then in 1992, they moved out to the suburbs, to place about Hoffman States, Illinois, into an office park. But let me show you the new paradigm. That used to be the world headquarters for Red Hat. Red Hat, by the way, is the second largest business software company in the world after Oracle. They've just moved from a suburban office park into downtown Raleigh, North Carolina. And this is where business is going. We're moving back downtown again. Here's a list of just some of the companies that have moved back into town from suburban locations in the past year. How about Facebook, Twitter, Living Social, Zappos, Quicken Loans, Sara Lee, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Moving from out there back down here. And by the way, downtown, we already got lots of existing infrastructure. We already got the street grids in. The sewers are there. The we, in many cases, we already undergrounded the power lines, except we've got all these beautiful old buildings like the former, you know, London store, the Zip store, whatever. You know, and then there's this other thing going on. It's called the Great Sort. You know, in, in a knowledge-based economy, the most important infrastructure is not roads. That's what we used to think it was. And, of course, in Alabama, our... Our approach to rural economic development was always, let's just widen all the highways. You know, or let's put an industrial park out by the airport, and let's, you know, put up a sign that says industrial park, let's try to put some sewer and water out there, let's try like crazy to get some plant, factory, or distribution center to move there. Guess how many plant, factories, or distribution centers we build a year in America do anything anymore? About 400. We've got 37,000 incorporated communities. So successful economic development is thinking about what you do have a lot more than what you don't have. And also, what's the most important infrastructure investment today? It's not roads, it's education. And that's because we have a big sort going on in America. It used to be college graduates were evenly distributed throughout the United States based on population density. We had about the same number everywhere. But today, college graduates are going where the jobs are. And kids with college degrees, you know, that's where they, and the jobs are going where the college kids are. So you go to Raleigh, Durham, or Austin, or D.C., or San Francisco, 45, 46, 47% of all the people who live there have college degrees. You go to West Virginia, 18%. You go to Las Vegas, 19%. Brookings came out with a study last week. It said 42% of all advertised jobs in America today require a bachelor's degree, 42%. But only 30% of job applicants have a bachelor's degree. What percentage of people in Birmingham have a, at least a bachelor's degree? 26%. So there's a disconnect there. We need to be investing in what we've already got. Education, better schools, making our communities more attractive for people who want to be there. Now, let's talk about another example of the horizontal dimension of sustainability. I'll show you two pictures. I'll ask you a couple of questions about this. The first one is a subdivision in, this is Manassas, Virginia. And this is this, uh, another street. This is Middleton, Wisconsin. And I want to ask you a couple questions about these two pictures. Okay, first question, which street would you allow brother to live on? That street or this street? And the next question, which street do you think the new houses are more affordable on? This street or this street? Next question, which street do you think is better for the environment? This street or this street? Next, last question, which street do you think is safer for children? This street or this street? 
Now, the difference between these two streets is 16 feet of pavement and the width of the street. Let's talk about what happens if you add 16 feet of asphalt to the width of the street in a residential subdivision. Well, the first thing that happens is you just increase the cost, excuse me, of every house along that street by thousands of dollars. Why? Because streets are the most expensive part of the development process. So wider streets, more asphalt means less affordable housing. It also means more soil erosion, more sedimentation, more non-point source pollution running off into rivers and streams. One acre of asphalt will generate 16 times as much runoff as one acre of end up. Now what's interesting about this is, you know, I've been in many planning commissions in America and I've seen a home builder come in and say to the local planning commission, I'd like some flexibility in the street standards. I'd like to have a little narrower streets. And the planning commission oftentimes looks at them like they're crazy, like they're trying to get something over on them. But suppose they came in with the, with the freshwater land truck or the you know, river keeper. And they both said the same thing for different reasons, because less pavement is both good for business and good for the environment. And by the way, which one of those streets is safer for children? Well, it turns out that the 24-foot wide street has been empirically proven to be at least four times safer. Why? Because the wider streets are, the faster cars go. So here is one tiny example of something that's good for business, Good for the environment, good for the community. Less asphalt. Okay? Let's talk about another example. I want to show you two streets. You need to know that the houses on these two streets are absolutely identical. First question, which street would you rather live on? This street or this street? <laughs> Same houses. Next question, which street do you think has higher property values? This street or this street? Last question, which street do you think has lower utility bills? This street or this street? Now, did you know that there are literally hundreds of studies that show that trees increase the value of residential property? And if you cut down all the trees around a piece of residential property, you can actually reduce the value of that property like 20%. And also, did you know that the temperature on a hot summer day on this street can be 9 to 10 degrees hotter than this street in the same city on the same day? What do you think that does to your air conditioning bill? Trees, good for business, good for the environment, good for the community. How about commercial development? Would you prefer to shop in a shopping center heavily landscaped with trees and bushes? Or would you prefer to shop here? Oh, I'd love to shop there. That looks great. <laughs> You know, we do research on this at ULI. We did a study in partnership with the American Society of Landscape <coughs> Architects. We looked at commercial development sites all over America. And what we found was that trees improve business climate in four, at least, at least eight different ways. I've listed four of them here. What are those ways? Number one, increases the rate of financial return, 5 to 15 percent. Increases the rate of project absorption, means you lease your stores faster. Increases employee productivity and morale and job satisfaction helps developers win support for supposed projects, especially in contentious situations. You want to get everybody upset, cut down all the trees. You know, I know people say, well, it's just cheaper to cut down the trees and grade the site. Maybe we can plant some new trees when we're done. Yes, you're right. It is cheaper. But you know, Mark Twain used to say a cynic was a man who knew the cost of everything and the value of nothing. You know, you make spend a little more money saving those trees, but you're going to more than make it up at the back end and increase sales price. Cost versus value. All right. Green space. It's one of our publications. Heard of design the bottom line. Optimizing return on perception. Isn't that an interesting term? Optimizing return on perception. And what this book is about is it details, once again, some of the hundreds of studies that show how green space parks, natural areas, et cetera, increase property values. Let me show you a couple of classic examples. Here's one. How about New York City? Where's the most valuable land in all of New York State? There it is. It's the land next to Central Park. Okay? Because the park creates value in the adjacent properties. Enormous value. What about, you know, leveraging green? We just built a wonderful new park here in town called the Railroad Park. 
Let me talk about how this park can create value. These are two new world-class parks. One is in New York on the left. It's called the Highline Park. The one on the right is the Millennium Park in Chicago. Highline Park is an abandoned railroad line. It's about a mile and a half long. It's 23 feet above the street level in New York. Mayor Ru Rudolph Giuliano wanted to tear it down. He's going to spend millions of dollars to tear it down. Mayor Bloomquist came in and said, well, we're going to save it. We're going to turn it into a park. A one and a half mile long park, 23 feet above the streets of lower Manhattan. It cost one point, it cost $152 million to restore that. That's a big ticket item. But guess what? Since, since that park opened, $2 billion in new construction has started right next to it. <coughs> $2 billion. So $152 million public investment leveraged $2 billion private investment. How about, how about Millennium Park in Chicago? Well, it gets 4 million tourists a year. It's increased the assessed valuation of properties bordering in the park by more than a billion dollars. It generates $190 million a year in new retail, hotel, restaurant, entertainment sales. This is how you leverage green space. You can already see it happening in Railroad Park. People are building a new baseball. They're building housing. I'll come back to this city in 10 years. That park will be ringed with new buildings. Because people love to live next to parks. Ever been to Savannah, Georgia? You think that the value of those parks around those little squares, <coughs> the property isn't really valuable? And you know, we, we've been doing this for years in this country. We just didn't think about it this way. You know, we have 16,000 golf course developments in America. 16,000 with houses all around golf courses. And why did builders decide to build, put houses next to golf courses? Because they learned that you could charge a lot premium for up to 25% for the same house next to a golf course than not next to a golf course. But guess what? Did you know that the vast majority of buyers in golf course developments in America do not play golf? <laughs> so you interview them. You ask them, say, hey, why'd you buy the house there? They go, oh, we like the view across the fairway. We like to live next to protected open space. Well, like, duh. <laughs> what does it cost to build a golf course? Millions of dollars. What does it cost to maintain a golf course? Millions of dollars. What does it cost to leave the open space alone in the first place? Almost nothing. And so, a huge number, a growing number of builders and developers start to figure out that maybe they could build a golf course development without the golf course. <laughs> it's what we call a conservation development. And what can you do here? Well, you can walk your dog, you throw a frisbee, you can play ball, you can have a picnic, you can do anything you want. What can you do on a golf course? You can play golf. And I'm not, there's nothing against golf. It's a great game. I'm sure many people in this room play it. But I want to tell you what the Wall Street Journal says about golf. They say we're completely overbuilt on golf courses in America. We're tearing them down now because we've got too many. And one of the reasons why is there's no growth in playing of golf. Wall Street Journal says, and I quote, 3 million people a year take up the game of golf in America. But guess what? 3 million people a year quit the game of golf. <laughs> Why? Too time consuming, too difficult, too expensive for, us, for many people. What's the most popular form of outdoor recreation in the United States and in Alabama and in every other state? Walking for pleasure. But until relatively recently, we didn't have anywhere to walk unless you want to go to the high school track or just walk on the street. That's why this building all these trails in the city makes so much sense. And why our, our members, developers, <coughs> building trails because they get more bang for the buck. You know, this is what's happening. I, I used to run something called the American Greenways Program, and we used to give out grants to build bike trails all over the country. And, you know, I'd go into a community, and, you know, like I went into Daphne, Alabama many years ago, and I was told, well, nobody in Daphne will ever ride a bicycle. And our response to that was, well, okay, nobody will ever ride a bicycle. There's nowhere to ride a bicycle. Now, of course, they have a fantastic trail that goes all the way across the causeway from Mobile all the way down through Fairhope, Daphne, Montrose, all the way to Point Clear. Probably the most popular bike trail in this state. You know, but during the Atlanta Olympics, we did a study. We were looking at cities around the country and looking at how many bicycle shops they had. We found a really interesting thing in 1996. At the opening of the Atlanta Olympics, 1996, Metro Atlanta had 3.5 million people. Metro Denver had 2.2 million people. Atlanta had 28 bicycle shops. Denver, a city with more than a million people fewer had 149. Well, how is that possible? 
Well, I'll tell you how that possible is because in 1996, Denver had 200 miles of paved off-road bike trail, and it didn't have any. Now they do. Now they have the Coca-Cola Trail, the Silver Comet Trail. And they have a whole trails organization, building trails all over the place. They're going to build a, a beltway of trails called the Atlanta Belt Line. You know, in, you know, America, bicycling is the fastest growing form of transportation in America. The number of bicyclists commuting to work has doubled in the United States in the last 10 years. In some cities, it's gone up by 800%. The number one bicycling city is Portland, Oregon. You probably know that. In the entire metropolitan area now, 6% of people commute to work by bicycle. That's a very small percentage compared to most, you know, other forms of transportation, but that's a pretty big number. 9.6%, 30% of the city, 11.3% in the urban core, excuse me, 13.1% in the urban core. But guess how, they, how much they cost to do that? They built a 300-mile network of bike trails, bike lanes, and bike paths for $60 million. That's the same cost, ladies and gentlemen, as one mile of urban freeway. Okay? You want to get more bang for your buck? We don't have enough money to build everything we want. The problem we have is we don't have enough choices in how to get around. We want to give people more options, more choices. Not everybody will ride a bike, but if you gave them an opportunity, a lot more people would. Full spectrum green. You know, parsley green, grass green, tree green, full spectrum green. You know, it's about a lot of things. Affordability, placemaking, community building, lifestyles, balancing things. Let me show you a project that's got it all. Here's the first apartment building, first apartment project in the United States, fully powered by photovoltaics. It's outside of San Diego. It's an affordable housing project. It's across the street from a transit stop. And because, you know, people can walk to stores, they can walk to transit, it becomes very affordable. They don't all have to have cars there. They reduce the parking standards. And 95% of their energy comes from the sun. Okay, let's talk about another thing, placemaking. Communities appeal, drives economic prosperity. Who says that? The National Association of Realtors says that. Talked about, once again, sustainable sustainability is about building places of enduring value. I love this quote from the dean of the University of Michigan School of Architecture. But building a landscape or a city that is not beautiful, it won't be loved. If it's not loved, it won't be maintained and improved. In short, it won't be sustained. You know, let's think about what development looks like. You know, first impressions are kind of important, and a good first impression, just like a meeting a person, is important, and a bad first impression is hard to change. Do you think you'd rather invest in a community that looked like Franklin, Tennessee, or a community that looked like Midfield, Alabama? <laughs> Which one looks more like a community you'd rather invest time or money in? If you don't remember anything else I say tonight, remember this. The image of a community is fundamentally important to its economic well-being. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that every day in America, people make decisions about where to live, where to invest, where to retire, where to vacation, based on what our communities look like. What they look like. All right, let me give you a couple of examples. This is, uh, let's take tourism. You know, this is the official travel guide for the state of Oregon. Here's their slogan, Oregon things look different. Can you imagine that the Alabama travel for sure said, Alabama, Things look the same here. <laughs> well, of course not, because who'd want to go there, right? But the truth is, the more any community in Alabama comes to look just like every place else, the less reason there is to visit. On the other hand, the more community does to enhance its uniqueness, architectural, cultural, natural, what have you, the more people want to visit, because that's exactly what tourism is. It's about visiting places that are different, unusual, and unique. Every place is just like every place else, there'd be no reason to go anyplace. Now, I know there's some people who say, oh, yeah, but beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You really think so? You think that scenic view has more value, or do you think this scenic view has more value? <laughs> you know, let me tell you what some of the leading real estate appraisers in the world say. They say, quote, you can put a dollar value on a view. They say, quote, scenic landscapes are an economic asset, not just because you and I think they're nice, but because other people are willing to pay to see the view and to experience the unique character of the place. They go on to say, quote, housing, hotels, offices with, with premium views command premium prices. The better the view, the higher the price. Now think about this. If you go to the beach in the summer, 
say, you, let's say you go to Gulf Shores in the summer, or Hilton Head, and you rent a hotel room with a view of the ocean, you will pay more for that room than the exact same room on the other side of the hotel. What are you paying for? You are paying for the view. Ladies and gentlemen, the scenic landscapes of Alabama have quantifiable economic value. Which is just one of the many reasons why I hope you reauthorize Forever Wild. One of the greatest programs in the history of the state, in my judgment. You know, our guys kind of get this. You know, look at this. Breathtaking views. Some years ago, the National Association of Homebuilders, they were trying to figure out, well, what was it that would add value to a house more than any other thing? Was it like the garage, the kitchen, you know, the, the, having a swimming pool, the type of appliances? It wasn't any of those things. You know what they found? It was the location of the house. The location, and particularly the location in relationship to green space, to water, to mountain views affected the value of a house more than the size of the house, the number of rooms, the type of appliances, or even the presence of a swimming pool. This is why realtors always talk about location, location, location. And you know, this, you know, if you think about economic development, there's a lot of things we should think about. This is one of the most important, distinctiveness. You know, capital is footloose in the world we live in today. If you cannot differentiate yourself from any other place, you have no competitive advantage. You know, Austin, Texas, they have this slogan, Keep Austin Weird. It's not just a funny slogan, it's an economic development imperative. Why do you think it's so attractive to young people, to high-tech workers? You know, it's because it's, it is a place that has a distinctive quality. You know, and once again, Birmingham ought to be thinking not so much about what we don't have, but what we do have and how we build on it. You know, we've lost tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs in the city over the last couple of decades. We've added tens of thousands of jobs in Eds and Mets. The biggest employer today is the University of Alabama, right where we are tonight. You know, and we need to build on that asset. And let's talk about how we arrange development and how that is changing. I talked about where we put development, what it looks like, how we arrange it. You know, we can keep spreading out or we can grow a little more compact, but there's a place people used to make fun of, Seaside, Florida. <laughs> you know, does anybody make fun of Seaside, Florida? One of the most valuable real estate developments ever built in America. You know, and I understand everybody doesn't want to sleep upstairs and shop downstairs. I get that. But some people do. Maybe like some retirees or some empty nesters or some unrelated <coughs> singles or some of those single women that I mentioned earlier. Some of those kind of like that idea. You know, in fact, we have an oversupply of large lot subdivisions and an undersupply of mixed use houses. And you know, mixed use can be pretty simple. Here's a new mixed use project in the small town of Herndon, Virginia. And this is a new Dairy Queen with a dentist office upstairs. How appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, walkable development is an incredible energy saving strategy. Turns out, you know. We could walk, you know, if we had few, could take fewer trips or shorter trips, we drive less. And you know, we're going to add 100 million people. And so maybe if instead of, you know, spreading out over the landscape, we started investing in walkable communities, we could reduce our energy use and people would be healthier at the same time. And here's what happens when you do that. This is, we did a study comparing two Maryland suburbs, Bethesda and Germantown. Bethesda is a mixed-use, walkable, transit-served suburb. Germantown is an auto <coughs> suburb. At lunchtime in Bethesda, 75% of everybody walks or takes the train to go to lunch, to go shopping, to run errands. But in Germantown, 90% of everybody has to drive if they don't have any opportunity to do anything else. Tyson's Corner, Virginia, the first edge city in America, has three rush hours morning, evening, and lunch hour. Because you can't walk to anything. But they just won the biggest award that the American Planning Association gives out for a new comprehensive plan that will turn this into a walkable, mixed-use place. Now, here's the old <laughs> paradigm. Strip malls. Here's the new paradigm. I want to tell you that the future belongs to downtowns, to town centers, and to Main Street. 
and that strip retail is retail for the last century. Let's talk about why. First of all, we're overbuilt on the strip. How overbuilt? Well, we went from four square feet per person to almost 40 square feet per person from 1960 to the year 2000. And that's twice as much square feet as anybody else in the world has in retail space. If the recession hasn't taught us anything else, it taught us we're overstored out on the street. Right now in America, we have one billion square feet of vacant retail space, mostly in empty big box stores out there. Right now, Metro Chicago has 175 empty big box stores, total 9 million square feet. And the largest opportunity of the next generation is going to be the redevelopment of our suburbs. This is a book written by a professor over at Georgia Tech, a great little book. But, you know, let me give you an example of this. This is sort of a metaphor for America. This is Rockville, Maryland. This is the county seat of Montgomery County, Maryland, outside of Washington. And in 1990, in their infinite wisdom, they decided to tear down their downtown and to replace it with that building you see in concrete behind you with a 200-story enclosed mall. Just think how many places we did this in America. You know, but guess what? Now they've torn the mall down and they put the downtown back. <laughs> As I said, that's kind of a metaphor for America, you know? And here's the new promised land. You know, we used to talk about, you know, paving paradise and, tearing, and putting in a parking lot, but now we're going to start tearing up the parking lots and putting paradise back. And of course, the reason for that is because all, we have all these sites. Millions of acres of you know, strip mall parking lots in front of vacant big box stores. A majority today of all housing being built in cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco is being built on commercially zoned land. It's on those empty strips on the Ventura Boulevards of the world. You know, and this is how the paradigm is shifting. You know, here's your best buy store. Spread out, single use, drive on. Here's another Best Buy story. Compact, mixed use, walkable. Which one's more profitable? Which one do you think you'd rather have in your community? You know, let me show you how this works in terms of profitability. This is the one in the store, this is a two Garns and Nobles. This one is on a road called Rockville Pike, and that is the busiest strip in the state of America. That's the highest traffic count of any non interstate road in the entire state. This is at Barnes and Noble in downtown Bethesda, Maryland. It's three stories tall. Sitting in the parking lot, there is no parking in front of it. Which one makes more money? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the one on the right makes 20% more per square foot than the one on the left, even though there is no parking in front of that building. You say, well, how does that work? Well, I'll show you how it works. That's Rockville Pike. That's downtown Bethesda. Well, there's only one way to get there.